Well, I am so grateful to Garrett for uh, just sharing those next steps with us. But I, there's just two things I want to mention really quick as well, just to piggyback on what Garrett said. First of all, I want to encourage you uh, not only to sign up your children and your children's friends and your grandchildren uh, and you yourself as well uh, for camp and for VBS. These significant retreats, they are they bring life change into people's lives. And I'm gonna be going to high school camp this year. I would love for you to go as well. We pay for every adult to go to camp. And so if you could go to a session of camp, whatever age group that is, we'd love to have you. We already have 325 kids signed up for camp. We got about another 100 adults already signed up for camp. We'd love to see that number grow to over 500 for this summer. And we don't want you to miss out. Uh, there's going to be some incredible growth happening. We want you to be a part of it. So I just want to encourage you, mark your calendars, make it a priority, schedule it into your life and your family life, camp and VBS this summer. So excited about that. And then to our moms, to our moms today, man, we're just honoring you. You know, I, I know many of you probably have mixed emotions today. Some of you, maybe you lost your mom, and so today reminds you of something missing. Today. And so that might be one emotion in the mix of many others. Some of you wanted to be mothers by now, and it just hasn't happened yet, and you feel like something's missing, and that's in the mix of emotions today. Some of you moms may just feel like the years went by too fast, or they're going by too fast, and, and, and today you're just seeing that, because you remember, you, some of you, it wasn't that long ago, you were standing up here, and now your kids are driving, and kids are graduating, and, and it just feels like it's going by so fast, and and maybe you don't feel as close to your kid as you used to, and maybe it's because they moved away or went to college or, or not as close as you once were. Maybe some of you moms, if you're like most moms, you wish you were doing it better or you had done it better. Don't we all, right? Don't we all? But mom, being a mom's hard. It's, being, it's really hard. I'm sure some of you moms can identify with Kathy Skuzin of South Jordan, Utah, she faced one of those moments that you have faced before where it was 20 minutes before the bus was to leave for school and she's finding out for the first time from her daughter that she was supposed to have a white t-shirt. It was drug awareness week and they were gonna imprint something on the t-shirt and she was supposed to take it to school and, and mom's finding out about it and racing around her room and in her drawers looking for a, finally finds this white t-shirt. It already had a slogan on the front but she thought the back's clean, they can just put the slogan on the back, you know, it's gonna have to do and sent her daughter to school, and her daughter came back later that afternoon, and, and sure enough, it worked out, and they just put the slogan across the back. So it just said on the front, families are forever, and on the back, be smart, don't start. That's what the shirt said. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you, child, for informing us at the last minute. And, and it's, it was a little too late for that. I think they had already started, but, but moms, I, I just want you to know, it is not too late today for us to carry out the purpose of this day, which is to honor you, it is to value you, it is to cherish you and acknowledge the significance that you play in our lives, that the role of motherhood is so significant, and we often don't express gratitude like we should, and, and I know we live in a culture that, that expects immediate payback or gratification. Motherhood's not like that. It's often not immediate payback or gratific gratification. We know, though, that the investment that you make is significant, that the impact you have is life-changing. We know that. And we know that for moms, there's no single mold. There's no one-size-fits-all to being a mom. We know that you have different metabolisms, different energy levels, different personalities, different interests, different capacities, different chemistries with your children or your family or with your spouse. Some of you are doing it with someone. Some of you are doing it as a single mom. Whatever mothering looks like for you, it's, it's going to be different. Some of you work outside the home. Some of you work solely from within the home. Some of you are hybrid as you work remotely at home and within the home. Either way, today I want you to know that we honor you and we value you because we know that this role that you play as mom is significant. It is vital and today, church, can we just praise God for our moms right now and just thank God for that role? So we just honor you today. And You know, today we're in week two of a series that we, it's called Friendships. 
And last week, if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go listen on our YouTube page just because we introduced this entire series. And, you know, we just said last week that when you come to the end of life, it's been witnessed that people seem to have clarity of vision. And one of the things that people have said over and over again they wish is that at the end of life is that they regret, one of their regrets is that they didn't maintain and grow closer relationships with their friends. It was a major regret of people as they got towards the end of their lives. They didn't develop them. They didn't maintain them. They let their relationships and friendships drift. And that when you come to the end of your life, you're not going to wish you put more hours in at work or more hours vacationing or more, more hours streaming shows. Or You're going to wish that you had been with a friend. And we talked about the five barriers to friendships and, and how this is that one relationship in your life that takes a lot of intentionality and purposefulness. And we, we just really challenge people to start going deep because a lot of our friendships are too broad. And today I want to build on that. And I just want to talk about this ache that every one of us has deep in our soul for friendship. That you have been wired, created, designed to have an ache for friendship. And as you think about that, I, I was, you know, looking, reading in the book that Drew Hunter wrote called Made for Friendship. And it's a book that we're using to lay out this series and we're leaning into significantly for our messages. And if you don't have it, I'd highly recommend it. You know, where he talks about two of the greatest joys in life is, is not only to develop deep, true friendships, but to also develop a deep, true friendship with, with Jesus, that those are the two greatest joys in life. But in his book, he was talking about how his wife's grandmother began to decline in health. And she just went through a season there where she, her health began to deteriorate, her happiness slowly declined. I don't know if they realized it in that moment exactly what was happening, but he said it correlated with the season in her life when she became less and less active there for she became more and more isolated. And whenever she was in her home every day, and when she wasn't around people, her health deteriorated. But then, because of her health situation, when they moved her into an assisted living facility, in that particular facility, she quickly developed some very close relationships with the neighbors that were around her. And whenever she began to develop those friendships, all of a sudden they realized her appetite began to be regained, and she started feeling well again, and that those friendships completely improved her health. She began to look like a different person, that, that one of the solutions to the many afflictions that often goes unrecognized is friendship, that when loneliness unravels us, it is friendships that put us back together. And they noticed that that was true, not just for her, it's true for everyone, for men and for women, for extroverts and for introverts. The U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy said that when he saw patients, the most common illness was not cancer, it was not heart disease, but it was loneliness. He said loneliness is a hazard to our health, and it increases with our age. Loneliness poses a particular threat to the very old, quickening the rate at which their faculties decline, and therefore cutting their lives shorter. <coughs> Because when we come unglued from others, socially, <clears throat> we become unraveled emotionally, psychologically, and even physically. Prison officials will call solitary confinement the prison within a prison because when people are put in solitary confinement, it's social isolation. And with it comes increased anxiety and depression and mental illness. <clears throat> and he says that isolation isn't just a negative Attention, it's no attention. And when you've got no attention, which is often worse, it unravels our humanity. I'm gonna give you an example of this. I don't wanna show the picture too soon, but I'm gonna show you a picture. And as soon as you see this picture, I want you to identify who it is. I want you to shout out the name. I think you'll recognize him. Here it is, here's the picture right here. Wilson, Wilson. yes, <laughs> this is Wilson. So obviously, some of you have seen the movie Cast Away. And if you saw that movie, Tom Hanks, he plays the part of Chuck Nolan, a FedEx employee who was, who was in a plane crash in the ocean, uh, is washed up on this deserted island where he lives for four years. And for four years in complete 
isolation. And if you've watched this movie, his mind was just going crazy. And there came this moment when he just needed more than anything a companion. He needed a friend. He took this volleyball, a Wilson volleyball, paints his face on this volleyball and uh, names this friend Wilson. And Wilson becomes his friend throughout this movie, which makes it particularly moving and upsetting whenever, um, whenever you see uh, he's out in the ocean and Wilson becomes detached from the tether and begins to float away. And Tom Hanks is yelling, Wilson. He can't get to Wilson because of the waves and, and the sea. And You cried, didn't you? It was a stinking volleyball and you cried. <laughs> you know you did. It was just a volleyball. It was a volleyball. And you were crying, and you're a mess, and you're blowing your nose, and all this stuff. Why? Because it just highlighted even more his complete aloneness, isolation, <coughs> helplessness, as his friend Wilson drifts away and is still drifting to this day. We don't know where Wilson is, and it just, it's just so upsetting. And if you play the game, five things that you're going to take with you on a deserted island, I I would hope after watching that movie and even after today, one of the things you say would be a friend. Not a volleyball, but an actual friend. (laughs) We need friendships. In fact, today I want to talk to you about three reasons to seek and to develop and to maintain your friendships. Thank you. I might need that here in just a second. Number one is this. God made you to need friendship. He made you to need friendship. The very first problem that we encounter in the history of our world and the very first problem that we encounter in the pages of Scripture, even before there's sin in the world, even before this place gets cursed and falls apart, there was a problem. There was something that wasn't right. There was something that needed fixed. And it was the problem of aloneness. It was the problem of isolation. In Genesis chapter 2, 18, in the early pages of Scripture, we read this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make us a helper suitable for him. It's not good. I want to focus on those words for just a minute. It's not good. Everything else in creation up to this point was good. Everything. In verse 4, God saw the light and he said, it's good. In verse 10, he separated the water from the land and the sky and he said, it's good. In verse 12, land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed, trees. God said, it's good. He then created the sun, moon, and stars, and the seasons, and the lights, and the days. It was good. In verses 21 and 25, all the creatures of the sea, and then the animals on the land, and God said, it's good. Everything was good, except it wasn't. There was something that was not good. Not everything was good. Not yet, because God looked at Adam's situation, and and God said, it's not good. What's not good? It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good. He was alone. What do you mean he was alone? He walked with God. He lived in a perfect paradise. He had everything he ever needed at his disposal. There was no pain, no suffering. He had God himself. You're saying God wasn't enough for Adam? If you say you need someone or something other than God, isn't that idolatry? What do you mean he needed? God created Adam to need a friend. God created and designed Adam to need a relationship, friendship. In fact, it's one of the greatest gifts as humans that we can enjoy that God gives us. It's the gift of friendship. He made us that way. And as creator, God knew Adam's need even before Adam knew of his own need. God created Adam to need friendship. And then God revealed to Adam that he needed friendship. And and here's how God did it. It's in Genesis 2. We're going to go up here on the screen. Well, it's up there. I'm going to grab a water real fast. In Genesis 2, we want to read this together, verses 19 through 22. And here's what we read. It says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. God used this process of naming the animals for Adam to come to this great and crushing realization, a realization that 
that, yeah, he was distinct from all the others in terms of intelligence and spiritual dimension and his emotional capacity and needs, but he also came to this crushing realization that there was something else that was different. Every other creature on earth had a companion, and he had none. He was alone. He came to the awareness that he was alone and that God didn't create him for life alone. In fact, the word that God used in this text for Adam's condition of alone can mean it's a piece or a part of something. His matching piece, his other part, his companion, did not exist yet. Adam didn't need a pet. He had lots of them. Adam needed another person. Animals are special. Those of you pet lovers out there, they're special. But friendship is essential. And he needed it. And he came to that crushing realization. And when he did, God created Eve. The text says that she was a suitable helper for him. And before you think that's a demeaning term, like she's just a helper to him, it's the very word used of God, like in Psalm 33, 20, and 70, verse 5, and 115, verse 9, all in Psalms, talking about how God is our help. He's our helper, as the NIV translates that. He provides what we can never be able to sustain or achieve or receive in and of ourselves. And when we look at the pages of Scripture, we see both Adam and Eve have the same nature. But what man lacked, she was able to supply. And what she lacked, he was able to supply. And so even before sin enters the world, even before there's a curse in our world, there was something that was lacking, and that thing was friendship. It was relationship. And we read this in Genesis 2, 21 through 22. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Tim Keller notes this. He says, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect, but because he was perfect. The ache for friends is the one ache that is not the result of sin. This is one ache that is part of his perfection. God made us in such a way that we cannot enjoy paradise without friends. That's why in heaven there's gonna be a lot of friends. God made us in such a way that we cannot enjoy our joy without human friends. Adam had a perfect quiet time every day, 24-7, 24 hours a day. Moms are like, that sounds like heaven. It was, it was paradise. And yet, he needed friends. And so after God created Adam and Eve, we read this in Genesis 1, 27, we go back to see the big picture account. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he had made. And it was, say it together, those two words, very good. Not just good, very good. It wasn't until this moment when God created Eve that he could look at creation and say it's very good. And Eve met Adam's need for companionship in two ways. Yes, as his wife, they would multiply the earth, but also as a friend, a companion. Marriages are ideally the best friendships, ideally, The bride in Song of Solomon 5.16 says, this is my beloved, this is my friend. We need friends. And when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he was not just highlighting Adam's need for a wife, but also the problem of man's aloneness. That was the emphasis. It's not good to be alone. We need companions. We need friendship. And when I think about that on Mother's Day, I want to say to our moms that you need friendship. You especially need it, not not just in the children's growing up years, but even in the years beyond. You devote so much to your children and family, you may feel like you don't have the margin or the time or the freedom or the flexibility to do it because your job's a full-time job, as the video in a very artistic way shows. But I want to encourage you to be intentional about your friendships, to help you through your parenting years. I, I know, I feel like my wife Kim did this pretty well, probably better than me. Through the years, she had personal friends that she connected with, and, and uh, they would call one another, and they'd visit one another and see one another. Of course, in those early years, um, 
A lot of that centered around what was happening. Uh, she wasn't working at the time during the week and gathering here and what was happening here. But they would also go on events together and retreats together and, and be women's Bible study together. And, and she developed those personal relationships. And then she had some friend groups where they were all friends with each other. And she very strategically used that as well to do things with those friends and to get together. And in those moments, they talked about life. They talked about their families. They prayed over one another. And she was very intentional about that. And it not only blessed her, it blessed me. Because the joy that comes from friendships, the support, the encouragement, the way that other women in her life were able to relate to her in ways that I can't relate to her. Girlfriends were really important for that. And she would return from those gatherings encouraged and strengthened because friends make us happier and whole, and they enrich our lives, and because it enriched her life, it enriched my life, which is why it was wise for me to encourage that. I know as, as, as married couples, we sometimes think of date night. We think of date night. But maybe we need to think about friend night, you know, where I'm watching the kids, and I'm putting kids to bed, and I'm doing that so she can be with her girlfriends because those were healthy, whole, good relationships to be with, and in those moments, they could encourage one another and strengthen one another and help one another. And, and we need to think about that more often. There's a different way in which we in, enjoy relationships. That's why when she's with her friends, she gets things out of it. She doesn't get with me. You know, women, they, they often prefer the face-to-face -face conversations and the interactions with that. Guys, typically side by side, we're doing experiences together. We're doing something together. That's different. And yet both are needed and both strengthen us. And moms need this. And I would even say that our single moms really need this. And, and I know it's really challenging because you, I, don't, I don't know if you realize, you know, there are two billion mothers in our world, two billion of them. And in many of those households, there are moms that are solo parenting while holding down one or more jobs. In fact, here in the United States of America, we see that 86% of single parent families in the U.S. are led by moms. 86% of the single parent families, they're being led by moms. So the majority of single parent families, moms are leading out, but 40% of single moms in the U.S. hold these low wage jobs and they lack paid leave. So think about that. Most of the families or a situation where mom is leading the home and the family and she's working, but the job that she has won't pay her when she needs to engage or do something with the kids. One in every three single moms spend more than 50% of their income in housing. That leaves no income, discretionary income for other things. And I'm, I'm just thinking, when, you know, here, here on Mother's Day, maybe there's a single mom that you know, a single mom that you're, have a relationship with. In some ways, maybe you could be thinking about, you know, how could you bless her on Mother's Day? How could you bless her? Because who else is doing that? You know, some, her kids, most of them are probably going, it's what? Mother's Day? What's that? You know, that's typically how moms feel sometimes with the kids. And so who's doing that for her? Maybe you could check to see, did she have to work? Can you find a way to bless her? Maybe she needs a babysitter. Maybe she needs a ride. Maybe you could bless her socks off with a gift or a flower bouquet or a heartfelt note or a gift card or Maybe a gift card to a grocery store or even a restaurant, something she wouldn't feel like she could do very often. If she doesn't have to work, maybe you can invite her and her kids to join you for an afternoon barbecue. Maybe you could, the best option would be just become her friend and keep on blessing her. Josh McDowell, in his email post, was talking about this, how you can, you can be the person that she can truly count on for love and encouragement and even wisdom if she asks for your advice. Because in his word, God repeatedly tells us that we need to bless people. and So maybe a mom, maybe a single mom could be that person that you bless because God made us for friendship. He made us that way. We need it. But secondly, let me mention this. God designed you like him to long for friendship. It's that ache that you feel in your heart for it. You were made in the image of God, just like him. You know, you know, God existed from eternity past in a relationship, 
in a community, a fellowship of love. In fact, just we're looking at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Notice the plural words. Let us, our, because God existed as one God in three persons. The Bible teaches God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, but he's in fellowship with himself in this community. He's communing Already, he eternally exists in this way, and we are made in his image. God, who exists in eternal community and fellowship and friendship, this is why you were made for friendship. It's wired into your DNA. God embedded it there. We were made for withness, so we could be with others. We cannot reflect God's beauty alone, not because it's difficult to do that, but because it's impossible to do that. We need others. We need an other. This is why Genesis 1.27 says this. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. In his own image, he created Adam and Eve, them, with this need, this desire for friendship, togetherness, withness. We long for it because God put it in us, in his image. Tim Keller said this. He said, the less you want friends, the less like God you are. The less you want friends, the less like God you are. When you withdraw from friendship and you move into passive isolation, you turn away from your very design. In other words, God's image is less reflected in a hermit off by themselves in their home than it is around a meal with love and laughter and friends together. And there may be some reasons why you may have pulled away from friendships in your life at some point. And maybe it's because you experienced some pain in those friendships or some betrayal or unmet expectations or maybe you're in a relationship where it just wasn't mutual. You know, the other person just wasn't wanting to go that deep that you were wanting to go. Or maybe it was just a slow drift over time. And today, you, as you think about it, you're like, man, you know, we've really drifted apart. Uh, friendship in the past, but it's not a present reality. Maybe you're just in different life stages. And you're realizing, man, that's had a real impact on our friendship. Maybe you got married. And when you get married, that can have an impact on your relationship with a single friend. And sometimes that single friend can feel undervalued or unappreciated or not desired anymore. And sometimes it's because the person gets married and that married person becomes their sole friend, like their only friend. Maybe that's affected that relationship. But I think it's important in those moments that we realize that, hey, yes, We may have to adjust our expectations. We may have to extend a little grace to one another. Yes, the relationship has changed, and now I'm married, so I'm not as flexible and having as much time maybe as I had before to pursue that relationship, and yet maintaining that relationship could still be very important. God designed you, like him, to long for friendship. There's an ache for friendship, to need friendship, to need that community. And so instead of it just being a past memory, let it be your present reality. You need it. He designed you for it. If you need an example of why we need this, why it's so important, then just look to Jesus. Because Jesus, as a human, he needed friendship. He desperately needed friendship. He didn't live alone. He built relationships with his disciples and his followers, which extended far beyond the 12. There were women in his life who helped support his ministry and were a part of that ministry that he was friends with. There was even a greater number of disciples that traveled with him at times. And Jesus, he walked the roads with his disciples. He engaged in lengthy conversations. He ate with them. They participated in feasts together in people's homes. He showed that he valued friendship. He desired friendship. He needed friendship. It's why when he went to his friends, And he went and saw Mary and Martha when his friend Lazarus died. That's how he's described. And he got there and he saw them mourning. And Jesus just began to weep. And the text says that he was troubled, disturbed in his spirit because of death, seeing what it does to friendships. And he wept. And then there's that moment when his tears turned to blood in anguish at the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying at that rock, crying out to God, and the capillaries in his forehead burst because of the stress and the tension and the anxiety and the weight on him. He had called his good friends to come near Peter, James, and John. Of course, they 
fell asleep and were not mentally present with him and it was so disappointing to him and hurtful. But he longed to be near his friends and the world has never known anyone more spiritual, more perfect than Jesus. A man, God in the flesh, and yet he needed relationships. He was a man of friendship because God is a God of friendship and he made us to desire friendship. And our enjoyment of friendship and even our most ordinary moments with our most ordinary companion is more profound than we often realize because it's a reflection of God's own infinitely joyous fellowship as Father, Son, and Spirit. This is why Jesus, who desires to be a friend with you, would say in John 15, 14 to 15, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. I call you friends. I want you to be in a relationship with me that is rooted in friendship, closeness, togetherness. And I, I don't know what your relationship with Jesus is like right now. I don't know if you, are, are you the, like the story of the prodigal son that Jesus tells, the son who leaves the father to go his own way? And it wasn't until he had an awakening, a spiritual awakening, and he came back to the Father, that he was reunited. Maybe you need to do that today. This relationship with Jesus has drifted away because of sin. That's why Jesus said, you are my friends. If you obey what I command, you're in fellowship with me. You walk in the light with me. If you obey what I command, I'm the vine, you're the branch. Stay connected to me. I want to call you a friend. And I just want you to know, as important it is that you have people in your life that you call friend, the most important relationship you need in your life is Jesus. You need that friend. You need him more than anything else. And how amazing to think of that, that Jesus, God Almighty, wants to be your friend. He wants to be your friend. He wants your relationship to be that close, that you're connected like, like friends. You weren't just made for friendship with others. You were made, you were designed, you were created for friendship with God. Wow! Have you drifted from that relationship? Because he would say a significant test of that relationship is your obedience. And so if you, if you want to be a friend with God, you, you live according to his design. You walk with Jesus. You have fellowship with Jesus. And when you do that, you commune with Jesus. And when that relationship is right, Jesus came not just to make your relationship with God right, so you could be friends with him, but so you could be friends with others and make these relationships right and reconcile with one another and allow his grace and his peace and his mercy and the Holy Spirit empowered, empowerment that's in your life to help you be a good friend to others. But you need him. And I want us just to reflect on that right now, that, that we would commune with Jesus. We would have fellowship with Jesus. We would fix our eyes on Jesus, that Jesus, you would be our friend that we would cling to you, for you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I know that we need friendships, and you designed us for friendships, but most importantly, we were created to be in friendship with you. And Jesus, right now, I just pray that for every person that's listening today, that, Lord, we would allow this to be a moment where we reconnect with you. We draw close to you. We walk with you. We align our lives with you. We are obedient and submissive to you. And we are connected to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.